Hello there, thank you for joining me again today. On the bench for repair is a Siglent PD3303X-E power supply. It's manufactured by Siglent for RS Components Limited here in England, or part of the RS Pro range. Uh, it's exactly the same as a Siglent model uh, variant of it, it's just rebranded differently, that's all badged up. Uh, this is a power supply which had a failure of um, turning itself off after it had been on a few minutes um, which you'll see in the video and uh, basically this is a power supply I picked up quite cheaply due to this fault and we were watching this beginning part of the video which is actually that after we'd done the repair which you'll see in the upcoming video that follows this introduction uh, where we detail the fault in its entirety and this power supply has a few tricks up its sleeve which you'll see um, and it's a true reflection of often what electronics engineers come across in their career where sometimes things don't often seem what they are which you'll see and um, sometimes you can think you've repaired something and then it comes back to bite you on the back side and you have to go back in again and find the true fault so join me in this video i think you'll enjoy it it's not only wood production it's a true reflection on um, trying to find a fault without a circuit diagram or service manual information tracking the component down to component level and then we deal with a rather unique problem um, which i won't give a game away at this stage but i think you'll see my point later on and uh, it's quite a rare fault but anyway on with the video and um, hope you enjoy it thank you hello there thank you for joining me again today on the bench is a uh, Siglent power supply uh, which has had a reported fault of no power um, powers up but then after a few moments it powers off if it goes back into some kind of default power off protection state anyway i picked this power supply up fairly cheap at a um, radio ham rally uh, that i attended recently and um, the guy who sold it me said it had this fault where you turned it on it powered up fine and then suddenly to go off anyway um, this particular brand of power supply is siglent because it's written all over the boards inside and uh, it's even kept the same model number as a Siglent power supply but it's made by RS components or branded that but it, it keeps the same model number as a Siglent version of this so it is a Siglent supply but just uh, rebranded uh, you can clearly see that you know Siglent's written on the on the PCBs as well so it's obviously a, a Siglent uh, power supply now, um, I found that um, it, it did this fault. We turned it on, it would um, power up normally and work fine for five minutes or maybe a couple of minutes and then it would just shut down. The fan would stop at the back and each time you try to power it up, you can hear the mains transformer hum so that the, um, the, the mains is getting to the mains transformer through this, the on off switch, which switches the mains input directly um, we've got live and neutral in live and neutral out going to the toroidal transformer so that's uh, obviously switching correctly as it should be so the fault looked like it was either in this section or possibly on the front board now um, I've gone around with circuit freezer because I've read on the internet uh, as you do uh, other people that have had similar problems and it turns out that uh, some of the people have remarked um, on the internet, I think on the EV blog forum, the Dave Jones EV blog forum, that the um, 7815 voltage regulator is a minus volt regulator and a plus voltage regulator here. And there's a little bridge rectifier circular one, uh, which we can just about see. I'll zoom in. And it's just there, it's that uh, black circle there. And um, somebody's reported replacing those and some other capacitor down here somewhere to one of these TL chips. 
which apparently started to get hot to the touch. Anyway, I went round, uh, powered it up. I managed to get it going, this power supply, just by switching it off, switching it on a few times. Then it, it came back up because there was quite a lot of times it wouldn't even come back up. And um, I started spraying all the way around the, the circuit board, including the processor, which is just hidden under there. That's the microprocessor there. Um, and there's some more voltage regulators um, just down here, which you'll see is one down there. And there's some more a bit further down underneath there, which is difficult to see. But basically, top and bottom of it is... Um, I went round with the, the circuit freezer to try and, uh, you know, coax the fault because I managed to get it powered up again. So if I just come back out again, so we've got a voltage regulator down there, uh, another voltage regulator you can just see down there in the middle. And then of course we've got quite a few other, uh, get this light to, to move in the right position. It never does, does it? Got quite a few uh, other ICs, capacitors, etc., um, that potentially could have dry joints, etc. So, what I did, I um, went round with a circuit freezer, uh, which in my case I couldn't find a circuit freezer, so I used air duster and turned it, you know, upside down as you do, and then it becomes, you know circuit freezer um, and went round the board and I could not get it to power off and then we use a screwdriver tapping syndrome all over the boards both the front board and the back board I sprayed circuit freezer on this board as well there was nothing triggering it to go off and it, it worked perfectly and um, anyway I just sort of left it on a while and uh, then I started feeling with my fingers and um, I noticed that this bridge rectifier was quite warm. Um, these two voltage regulators was, they were, they were, they were. I wouldn't say they were hot, but they were quite warm, but not dangerously warm by any stretch of the imagination. Anyway, um, basically the top and bottom of it is is that I um, just happened to put my fingers on these capacitors, just you know like that, and this capacitor here was quite hot and uh, when I smelled my finger I mean it's not bowed up at all this uh, capacitor by any stretch of the imagination it's not domed out like they normally are in the vent but when I smell my fingers after I've touched this capacitor I can smell the um, electrolyte that's in the capacitor on my finger so it's definitely leaking this capacitor was warm but this capacitor, I'd say, was getting between warm and hot. It was significantly warmer than the bridge rectifier, put it that way. This board does get a little warm round here because this bridge rectifier is um, warming the board in this area. So they are a little warmer, these capacitors, this one included. But that was very warm, noticeably warm. I'd say that capacitor is warmer than the 7815 voltage regulators that are here. So I'm convinced this capacitor's got an issue. So what we're going to do, we're going to take the board out, uh, which is going to be interesting, removing this entire front panel board to get this damn circuit board off. And then uh, we're going to replace, well, first of all, we'll check that capacitor. And I've got with me on the bench here that I've recently picked up, because uh, um, I have these peak meters. I've got this uh, latest new version that's just come out which I bought just this weekend gone, um, the Atlas LCR45. So I'll be using this to test the capacitor. But uh, quite an interesting fault. It was like a definitely temperature related fault because naturally the fault didn't occur when you wanted it to, which is always the case. And then when you didn't want it to, i.e. the lid was on and I would just got it sat on the bench, then it would intermittently click off. And the fan would stop as well. The fan's silent running in these as well, so you can't hear it. But you can see it, and you can obviously put your hand there and feel the air coming out. So, it seemed a bit strange, I don't know. But um, definitely a problem with that capacitor, definitely. 
so maybe that's the issue so we'll come back and um, when we've got the board out and got that cap out to test it anyway just a little note there about when I say I touch things with my fingers I obviously know what I'm doing I've worked on power supplies for many decades um, I would never try and stick my fingers on things that I know to be live components obviously so this is just a little safety note to those who are not very familiar with mains operated equipment or working with mains operated equipment um, in this context the mains input is on a, an IEC connector at the back it comes in it's fairly well insulated is the voltage selector board at the back although I wouldn't go sticking my fingers there unless you know you want half a day with the undertaker even though it's protected somewhat there's still some exposed parts so you know don't go touching that uh, these cables here all carry main supply and um, they have the taps on the transformer primary which go to selection switches in the back for voltage selection for international markets so all that is live at mains potential um, obviously the IEC connector they've done a good job down there of insulating it the best that they can but don't go sticking your fingers there and assuming that these components are not live because as you can see there are still some exposed metal work and things that are down there that you can see and it only takes a glance in touch and that's it you get a shock and likewise this PCB as well is live we've got some capacitors on there as well with live leads and the switch assembly so again you know avoid touching when it's plugged in so but the rest of it as in the um, rectification for the actual power supply output itself is down on this board There's some diodes down there right deep down you can probably see them when I tilt it up they're down there look at in front of the heat sink and there's also some series pass transistors that are bolted to the heat sinks on both sides for the dual channel aspect and uh, this heat sink um, although I don't suspect it to be live I would always treat that as a live surface because sometimes um, heat sinks are live and so even though the electrolytic capacitors which are here the reservoir capacitors which are the primary smoothing agents for the supply um, are rated at 63 volts DC so I'd always you know um, side on caution that there could be you know 63 volts present or 60 volts at least present somewhere in here which is enough to give you a bit of a belt if you were to touch it with wet fingers or moist fingers so and obviously these heat sinks are separate from one another with it being dual channel because the relays on the front here that are down there these black relays and there's some more relays here can switch the supply in parallel or in series mode so you can get multiple um, combined current output or um, higher voltage output as well by pressing the buttons on the front will switch the configuration in different ways so the potential to have some voltage on here which if you were to go between chassis and then onto the heat sink with your hand you could get a shock I doubt it but because I have no technical information on the product uh, I've not measured any voltage there yet with a meter but that's what I would always do before trying to touch it if I needed to do that like for example to touch it see if it was getting hot um, I would never just touch it without first checking to see if it was live otherwise you know you're asking for it and um, likewise I wouldn't go sticking my fingers down on the board here although we're low it we're re, you know reduced voltages at, in the maybe the 50 volt range um, I certainly wouldn't go sticking my fingers down there just to see what what's hot specifically on conductive parts like the diodes the rectifier diodes that are down there I wouldn't go sticking my fingers across those leads and things I might touch the diode shells with my fingers knowing not to touch the leads and I might touch the capacitors but I wouldn't touch the fuse holder that's down there with my fingers or other exposed circuit components because obviously there's a risk of a shock but um, experienced people know what they're doing and uh, they might touch the capacitor there just to see whether that's getting warm or bowing up or whatever so 
toroidal's fairly safe to touch because it's well insulated um, not only do we have the secondary windings coming out um, of the toroidal transform which are these main cables here that you can see going down to the board they provide the high current low voltage side for the actual supply itself but then we have um, a separate supply which comes out on these wires from the toroidal transform which carry a lower voltage uh, roughly around about the um, 25 volt mark AC into here at a lower amperage and that goes through then uh, various rectifiers that's on the board that we can see so we've got the uh, bridge rectifier which is wedged down here this uh, canister thing so that will be one supply obviously smoothed by these reservoir capacitors before being supplied to different parts of the circuit possibly these regulators uh, and then with some other diodes that you can see down here which form a bridge rectifier as well so those themselves or half wave rectifier will also supply other parts of the circuit as well such as a microprocessor the microcontroller and then um, the display panel on the front and the keypad um, multiplexer and all the circuits surrounding the monitoring of the output and um, microprocessor functions so all that's done on that board but again i wouldn't go sticking my fingers on things that i don't know you know uh, would be live um so i wouldn't for example you know be deliberately touching things if i didn't know what the supply voltages were there you know so always be safe um i would touch these fins here to see whether they were hot and these capacitors maybe these are the capacitors but um, anyway when you when you touch things like the microprocessor leads the actual um, leads on the microprocessor resistance of your finger could cause it to shut down because you could suppress the clock crystal um, signal that comes from the little crystal that's mounted on the board uh, which you can see just below the microcontroller chip which is this um, silver can there that that crystal so by physically touching these leads with your skin of your finger could cause the microprocessor to stop running and cause it to crash or um, fail so that would be a false um, failure if you did that so that's just a little rundown about that and how it works but um, I think it's uh, probably the capacitors on the board it may be that they all need testing desoldering and testing with the SR meter just to make sure that um, there's nothing there. Now I did um, off camera um, read the input voltages to the uh, voltage regulators on the fluke meter and we had a, a 1.3 volts um, AC waveform. It was like a sawtooth wave. It um, On the peak of the AC cycle from the bridge rectifier supplied via these smoothing capacitors to the input of these voltage regulators dc regulators um, you could see um, a sawtooth wave rather where it ramps up to the peak of the um, signal the ac waveform and then it it comes down and then ramps up again for the next cycle half cycle of the ac waveform and then ramps down again and up and that level difference was 1.3 volts AC at 100 hertz. So naturally, um, that means to me, uh, and so would any experienced electronics engineer, that the smoothing capacitors are not functioning as they should be. Um, but obviously then when I touched them and found that they were hot and the smell was on the finger, and I've marked this capacitor with a... Uh, biro um, felt pen to identify it so I know to uh, change it at a later date if I don't get time to do it tonight I don't forget which cap it was uh, all the other caps didn't feel hot or warm to the touch it is unusual for capacitors to feel hot actually um, they normally do that just before they explode if the voltage is too high to them um, so fortunately that didn't happen but I could smell from time to time before I touched them the smell of a capacitor leaking um, so it could be that um, this had some kind of internal reaction and it was overheating internally but not sufficiently enough to make it vent from the top 
as in a full blown explosion because um, some of the capacitors that uh, I've replaced earlier today on other pieces of equipment this has splayed up it, it, it splits does that little um, protective cap these little split caps on the on the tops there they normally all puff up and then they, they literally just open up like a, a clamshell and uh, you can see all the internals and they can vent off this cloud of uh, ammonia smelling smoke or, or steam so there's no sign of any uh, capacitor deformation there so I would presume that would be down to the capacitors on its way luckily it didn't explode because it could make a bit of a mess when they go off like uh, explode out and all the capacitor foil unravels and then all the uh, wax paper and the um, it's like a cottony substance it goes all over the place and it stinks vile so fortunately we haven't got that uh, that that bad at the moment with it but there are uh, one or two other capacitors that I suspect may also be um, with them being the same brand um, I'll be looking out for some of the uh, telltale signs that other capacitors may have failed so while I've got the board off I'll desolder these capacitors and and see whether they too are failing so we'll do that next but a nice power supply very nice little power supply i've never owned a siglent power supply before and uh, i think rigol and siglent are the very similar company or i'm not sure if they are the same firm but i've got a rigol scope but never had a a siglent uh, power supply I'm not sure how old this power supply is, I think it's been around a few years now, but um not sure how old it is exactly, I'll do some research on that. You can upgrade the firmware on it, because that was another consideration that I had. Had I not been able to find a fault with it, which I have done, then I was going to upgrade it through the Ethernet port of the USB to the latest firmware version, just in case the firmware was corrupt and it was somehow causing it to shut down due to a, a corrupt memory but um, that was clutching at the straws really but um, very nice power supply indeed i must admit quite pleased but um, we'll just have a look at these uh, these capacitors and see what we can uh, what we can do i also noticed as well that this 7815 voltage regulator it had about 24 volts dc coming in and only about 11 coming out instead of 15 volts so I think this has been put under load by these capacitors and that's why they're heating up. So these are only rated to about 1.2 amps, something like that. So any more than that, then they will start to overheat and also reduce the output voltage as well to compensate. So it could be that that's where the fault is. I hope so anyway, because I don't want to start delving in deeper. And there's no diagrams for these or helpful information, you know, so we are really taking a chance. So, right, we'll uh, whip it apart and see what we find now. Back soon. Okay, so in order to get the front panel off, you have to remove the screws that are underneath. And uh, there's four of them in total in these locations here. And then the front sort of comes away. Um, now, this drops out, which is the power um, switch actuator. It slides onto the actual shaft of the, uh, of the power switch there. So that drops off. So just have to be careful that you push that off before you remove a front. Otherwise, with this being delicate, it could break those little fingers there. Um, obviously, put all your screws and everything in a tray so you don't lose them. Anything that you remove. Now, looking at the um, front panel, um, what I'd like to do is this invasive repair that I can. These have got hot snot on them that have glued them down, so I don't really want to start hacking that off to try and pull the cables off i think what i can do if i just remove this ribbon cable which is just a case of um, being very careful because obviously if you messed this up then you ruined it but uh, this little adhesive tape here connects to the outer body shell of the plug the actual ribbon conductive strip for the uh, lcd display plugs into the black um, plastic thing so what we need to do is we need to undo this adhesive tape then lift these black lugs up at both sides to then allow the ribbon to be withdrawn from the plug 
and we will do that very carefully you don't want to be doing that in a rush and once that's done then we'd remove all the screws around the uh, the outside edge and obviously for the terminals which are these screws here which go through to these front terminals and uh, that would then allow ultimately once we've done all those remove them um, because we've got them in all the corners you know some more here and further down at the bottom there once they're all out then the board will come away from the front panel and that then will expose the connections then for the components underneath hopefully um, so that's what we'll do next but this has got to be done very carefully otherwise you could uh, ruin your power supply so probably best to use something like a scalpel blade or a very very fine thin uh, flat blade screwdriver like a jeweler's screwdriver just to pry up gently the adhesive and then using your fingers pull the adhesive tape away from the body the white area of the socket and then lift up the two black lugs to then free the the ribbon cable but be very gentle and careful doing that because it's so easy to break those are very fragile those plastic uh, connectors so we're back in the mirror so we get it started like that i try and hold the cameras to hand job again so we just get it started using a scalpel just to get that tape up the corner don't use any other implement other than your finger and just start to to peel peel this tape up so that we remove it from the connector very gently it's not a rush and then we've lifted it up you see to then expose that connector and the ribbon then needs to come out now I tend to use my fingers as best as I can and then we're not using any sharp implements and likewise on this side as well if we can just get that out of the way and then the fingernail underneath there now be very careful just gently does it we're not uh, we're not Arnold Schwarzenegger we're not going to tear the connector off its thing but then what we do then is we just very carefully allow that to come up to the top and now that that can be pulled free but again side to side motion little very gently and then now that will come out when we get ready to remove the PCB and there we are you see and we've maintained integrity without knackering it because once you've knackered it that's it it's you know or another expensive uh, parts request to Sigmund no doubt to get that so and uh, be very careful with these connectors these are easy to break they normally break where that little lug is down there that tiny little black lug that you can just see going in there that normally snaps off and then this then just flaps about in the breeze it doesn't then pinch the uh, conductive surfaces down in the in the ribbon to the socket and that's it then game over so that's that that just shows you how to remove that it's quite an important step okay so the next step is to uh, remove the the knob from the front pull that off so that when we do free the board then we're not uh, going to damage that so that comes off next then we undo all the screws that go around the board the the smaller ones that are on the corners uh, there's a couple on each corner across the top and then also um, one in between these posts as well a smaller one and then we're left then with the larger screws for the terminals themselves we won't be able to get to that until we remove this earth and uh, once the earth lugs removed then uh, that will allow this wire that's quite short in length that's restricting movement of the dis of the front panel um, that will then de-restrict it and um, in de-restricting it will then allow us then better access for the larger tool which we'll use uh, which I think is a Torx what is it I think these here are a uh, yes these are a, a T uh, 20 t20 so that allows then to remove the terminals for the front so then that should allow the board to to come away so 
be careful with this put it to one side it should have a shape proof washer on it but uh, I can't see that or a crinkle washer it's got a double washer there though but uh, ideally a flux should have a shape proof on as well but um, anyway that earth being removed now allows us now to, to be able to physically move this around a bit more and uh, then we can get to these terminals and remove um, the screws to allow the board to come away. Now what I would do as we take the screw out as I've done in this case just to show you the actual terminal itself withdraws um, but to make sure that when we reassemble it you get the colour coding right just make sure that you're fully aware what terminal goes where when you withdraw the terminal and what I would do as well to just to make sure the screws don't go missing or get put in the wrong place because you know some of the screws on the lid are very similar size to this for the handle I put the screw back in so when we're ready to redo it and that way then if a tray that's holding the screws drops on the floor then at least you've got the screw with the terminal and that's that so that's what you need to do next for all the terminals on the front and I think this little slider will have to come off as well this thing I'll look at that though next I'll see how that comes off because I think that'll have to also come away because that attaches to the switch I'm just trying to find a way of removing that without smashing it obviously because sometimes these plastic parts can be a bit stuck a bit jammed back soon right the next thing to remove once you've removed all the uh, the terminals and all the screws around the outside edge the board will start to sort of turn in its mount it's this earth um, screw there for the earth cable and that needs to come off next and then that will allow the uh, the front cover to come away now obviously before the front cover gets removed um, there's this um, knob on the front which I'm going to show you in a moment for the switch so we'll remove that cable now on the front and we looked at that switch earlier uh, which is this slider switch here and the little knob part which uh, goes on the on the front and uh, that's it there now that's what it looks like inside it's only tiny but when you pry that off you're best off using like a plastic spatula rather than a screwdriver because the screwdriver could scratch the, the plastic or indent or chew it up because it is quite difficult to get it off so use like a plastic spatula or trimming tool puller for a car trimming tool something like that something plastic non uh, scratching no no metal otherwise you could end up um, you know scratching the, the surface of the uh, the plastic bezel at the front and then the uh, circuit board's ready for coming out so if we just gently remove the, the circuit board and uh, Oh, the front away the front still got some weight to it so we can just put lay that down and then at least now we can get to those capacitors and uh, another components as well look underneath so that's where we are so we'll desolder them and test them now see what uh, what the test results reveal okay so we're now joined by um, the technical manager's wife Poppy, who's made an appearance for the first time on the YouTube channel. Um, Poppy is Bob's wife, Bob the technical manager you saw earlier in the video. He also featured in a lot of my other videos. And uh, so this is Poppy, who's uh, come to guide us on uh, capacitor selection. So we've got some uh, replacement capacitors already out the parts bin, ready. And then um, these capacitors down here, who are going to replace get the solder uh, desoldering station on and then we'll uh, we'll replace and come back okay so we've desoldered the capacitors and checked them on the ESR meter uh, initially when I checked the capacitance values on the standard LCR meter the capacitance values were correct or near abouts anyway um, however measuring the ESR of them has revealed that they are damaged so that 
um, just goes to show you in comparison to the uh, the new capacitors that we've got. Now the new caps that I've got are slightly higher rating in capacitance, same voltage. Instead of I think what were they now? Two thousand two hundred mic at sixteen volts. Yeah, so they were two thousand two hundred at sixteen volts. And the replacement ones that I've got, because I can't find all my capacitors, all buried under boxes and stuff. So I found the nearest one, 3,300 mic at 16 volts. So these should give better uh, smoothing of the um, bridge rectifier. But anyway, I've uh, had the voltage regulators out. This is an L7915CV voltage regulator, and that's an L7815CV. Um, Basically the bridge rectifier as well. I did check that just in case one of the diodes have gone short um, Thus potentially putting AC components onto the DC rails on the output, but that's okay All the four diodes in there all check correct on the meter. So it's not the bridge rectifier that's at fault uh, We can see with the arrangement. We've got an AC fuse here the toroidal transformer as an output which goes one of the outputs goes via this fuse to the bridge rectifier at AC side while the other AC side of the bridge rectifier goes directly to the toroidal transformer winding so we've got AC supply developed across the bridge rectifier bridge rectifier then has a common rail output which then goes off to two electrolytic capacitors which are these reservoir caps that we were looking at earlier they in turn are paralleled across the output supply of the positive supply um, there which then goes off to the supply the, the regulators which you can see on the underside with the the print um, so yeah strange um, I don't know whether the fault on these capacitors has been caused by the heating effect of the um, being such close proximity to the um, bridge rectifier I do note that this fault does occur more so when the supply has been on a while and that was a fault that was described by the previous owner that when the supply has been on for a little while then it uh, shuts itself down so what i did as well is um, um i heated the capacitor up one of the capacitors that i've taken out with a soldering iron just warmed it a little bit by touching the soldering iron on the top and the capacitance varied wildly as well as the sr so it's one of these things where even if it were just warm, it, it was changing its value quite quite effectively. Anyway, um, it's unusual, I must admit. But um, so I'm gonna, I was gonna renew the bridge rectifier, but I don't think I'll do that because I'm confident that that's fine, unless it's a voltage breakdown issue, which I can test that if need be. But um, the bridge rectifier, I'll put back in, replace the two electrolytic caps. I'll take this one out next and just check that make sure that's okay uh, I think this is a resettable fuse there um, we've got quite a few of the little caps out here so I think I'll take some of those out as well and just check there's nothing else really that I need to remove at this stage while we've got the board out but uh, yeah we'll see where we get to okay um, the capacitor that's here which is a uh, 220 mic at uh, 35 volt rating that uh, on the uh, LCR meter was reading quite low when we read it and um, Anyway, I, uh, I, I I measured it uh, the one that was in there and it was reading quite low so I Thought we'll change it not too low. I think it was about 190 microfarad instead of 220 but you know, it's um, out of its tolerance so thought I'll replace it anyway uh, these two caps are the new ones, the bridge rectifier is in, that voltage regulator is in. Uh, looking at the architecture, obviously we've got the main the fuse here which is for the AC supply to the bridge rectifier down here. Uh, that in turn, the output is moved by these two reservoir capacitors which are in parallel. And then um, this capacitor here is actually on the input, I believe, to the... Uh, voltage regs um these two voltage regs so that's for that um the supply rail from the two reservoir capacitors comes down which is this silver trace here uh comes all the way down round and then links to all these series connections here which are the relays uh these black cans here the 
switching relays. Uh, and then that then goes off then to a bit of uh, stitching around here um, to this connector which then follows all the way back to this board here so that must presumably give a supply to that board as well for something um, the stitching on this track here the positive rail that goes to there that's stitched down there on a, on a little island which goes through to what appears to be this inductor uh, and from what I can work out just about at a glance um, this inductor provides um, I think it's a chopper circuit a bit of a book converter uh, probably via this regulator IC to provide probably 3 volts DC to this ARM processor here um, I assume it runs from 3 or 5 volts whichever so it looks like as if that's this circuit here in this area is some kind of voltage regulator for the processor um, I'm going to check these capacitors around here we've got 100 mic at 35 volts uh, a couple of the capacitors I'm just going to desolder those next and just check those um, this is sort of consistent though with the problem that we had earlier where we had um, obviously an unstable supply to this microprocessor which then caused it to shut down probably through the reservoir cats being uh, not moving properly um, but I'm interested to have a look around here because this switching circuit sometimes these capacitors um, with the energy that they that's going through them can um, start playing up particularly the higher voltage ones so we'll have a look at that next and see what these capacitors are reading so back soon yeah, so that's that capacitor that we're reading, this uh, 220 uh, mic. This varies, this capacitance, by the way, when you when you hold it or warm it up, uh, the capacitance starts to vary uh, quite wildly as well, depending on what temperature it's at, so we'll uh, we'll replace that anyway. But that's that capacitor, I was just saying that we're at near the voltage regulator, so it's about currently at the moment. About 20 microfarads off, but still, I like to see voltages and, well, ratings anyway, close to what we're, we're wanting. Certainly not happy about that, so that's why I swapped it out. May as well while we're in. Okay, remove the uh, capacitor, which is just here, which appears to be on the voltage output from this regulator to the processor. It's 100 mic at uh, 35 volts, I think, rating. Um and it's reading 96.93 microfarads, so that's okay. I think that we're okay with that one. Let's just remove the other now and check that. Okay, so we've put the power supply all back together again and um, switched it on. We've got uh, it powered up at the moment, everything seems okay, all the outputs are on, um, all looks okay. When this was first turned on initially, before we've done all the component replacement parts, it would have only stayed on around about a minute, if that, and then it would have just clicked off. Well, it's been on for about half an hour already and uh, and been okay. And um, as I say earlier in the video, uh, these capacitors were getting quite hot to the touch, particularly this one. That bridge rectifier that's down there, there's a, a little bridge rectifier. You can probably just make it out that little uh, round circle to the touch that is uh, that is quite warm is that it is uh, yeah it would it would burn the end of your finger touching it put it that way if you kick finger on it it's significantly warm so I think what's happened is the heat conducting from that because of its close proximity it's snugged up against these capacitors is probably sweating those caps out and likewise this 35 volt um at 100 micro at 220 mic capacitor is wedged up against it had there been a bit more space in between all these components chances are it wouldn't sweat these out um so that's you know standard sort of thing that happens with these capacitors anyway we'll see what uh what happens i'll leave it powered on for a significant amount of time the fan's silent running i can feel air being blown out i think um what we perhaps could have done with is having a bridge rectifier bolted to a heatsink, you know, and uh, that way 
it will prevent it running at maximum sort of temperatures all the time perhaps down here bolted to the chassis or something or somewhere um or a fan inside blowing cold air onto the uh front of the panel of the unit and then obviously an air um system then like what we've got now where we've got a fan that expels air out the back so it could be that you get nice uh um air cool air blowing on things as opposed to just letting hot air um be drawn out so blow cool air onto the uh, components to keep them cool uh these regulator ICs that's quite warm it's it's just warm really verging on yeah these are, are mildly warm you can certainly feel them keep your fingers warm if you keep them on them but um that bridge rectifier is definitely slogging its guts out regards to uh, and I can feel the warmth on those capacitors when you use a more sensitive part of your hand on on the back of your fingers on the capacitors there's some definite warmth there being conducted through those through those capacitors so I can understand why the fault happens now it's not really apparent at first um, I suppose the only other thing to do really, which we could do at a later date, um, perhaps recommended for anybody who's repairing one of these, is to get another bridge rectifier with the leads that are quite long on them. Oh, it's gone off. So, that's that then. Ah, so the fault's shown itself now. Let's switch it off and then switch it back on again. Ah. That's interesting. Let's see what happens now after it's discharged a little bit. You can hear the transformer powering up, but that's that's not powering up. Hmm. Very good. Wonder if it's the uh So it's that little charge pump thing that stopped running. Possibly. We'll have to look at that. Okay, so now we're reaffirming the fault again, um, which is turning it on. It boots up, obviously, goes into uh, this stage. Now, I've noticed that when the fault occurred, uh, when I switched it off and back on again, and I managed to get it to come back on briefly, when you activate the outputs for all outputs and the, you hear the click of the relay inside it tends to draw more current because you can hear um, some strain being taken by the uh, the inverter which supplies the sub voltage to the microprocessor and I assume also supplies the voltage to this display panel as well as uh, the relays too uh, are fed off the same supply rail from that bridge rectifier they were looked at on the other side and it seems that when you hit this high current consumption um, button by obviously switching the output on it loads the the circuit more as well so when you select that and I can hear when that's enabled I can hear what appears to be the oscillator down here on the board that we're looking at earlier I can hear something screeching or screaming oscillator wise like a um, a coil resonating at a frequency of the switch mode power supply type sound it's like a high-pitched whine a whistle you might not be able to detect it on the camera but I can hear it when I hit that button there and the relays come on so it's as if uh, it causes a load somewhere and then uh, maybe reduces a voltage perhaps when the relays are energized and thus perhaps the oscillator is struggling to run which is what we were looking at earlier uh, these inductors on the top part of the board, which I think generate either three or five volts. Those coils there, you can see with the blue tops on. Um, there's two of them actually. There's another one to the left and right of each other, and there's a capacitor in between. You can just see them there. Might be better with a bit more light there. Look. Um, now they seem to be making a noise. I think they supply the uh, microprocessor as well as the front panel with a. A switch supply probably part of a book converter regulator circuit I could be wrong with that diagram it's difficult to tell 
but when it's off load as in working like this without the output being switched on hence those relays to energize the outputs being enabled by pressing this button it lasts a lot longer now the moment i switch the outputs on i can hear something you know trying to oscillate and struggle um, and then it doesn't take that long after a few minutes for it then to switch off and i notice as well the bridge rectifier when the output switched on the relays are energized gets a lot more hotter very progressively quick than uh, it would do when the these outputs are switched off so i think when it does go off and obviously i have to take it all apart again and go into it it might be worth me going into the um uh the stage where i can monitor the output voltage on the bridge rectifier because that's the ancillary power circuit that powers all the logic and everything else which obviously controls the fan the relay outputs and such like now if i switch that off a second and then touch that bridge rectifier with my finger and these regulators i can tell that it's noticeably yeah it's it's what it's quite hot there i can't hold the my finger on the end of that bridge rectifier so it'll burn my finger there you are look it's gone off fan stop running um if i switch it off switch it back on again it may boot again but how long it'll last for i don't know but uh once i, I switch the output on it tends to not last long before it goes off so I might spray some circuit freeze on that bridge rectifier, but I need to see what the output's like, the DC output to the regulators on the bridge rectifier, so I need to disassemble it all again. And then obviously, um, once I've done that and I've disassembled it all, um, then I need to be able to um, look at the voltages on the output of those two regulators plus, because they're the ones that supply all the logic board with all its power. And I think something in that power circuit's going off. Either the bridge rectifier is breaking down with temperature, so as it's getting really hot, like it was when I took, put my finger on the end, it's breaking down because of the the temperature. Or it could be that the voltage regs have got a problem as well. So I don't know. It seems a bit strange. Now you can turn it off, and then turn it back on again, and it'll reboot and find itself. Seems a bit strange, but there comes a point where it'll switch off and then it won't come on again at all then. So it's just gone off by itself there. The fan stops, obviously. You either relays all de-energize. So if I switch that off and then back on again, let's see whether it comes back on. Now, it's not doing it now, you see. You can just see the fan trying to turn, but it ain't doing it. Just leave it off for a few moments. So what I might do is spray that bridge rectifier uh, with, there you are, look it's come on. Although I've, I pressed it to go off already, I've latched it. Let's see whether that, so it's back again, there it's gone. So that's interesting. I wonder if, uh, I think I've done this already though, uh, the on spraying circuit freezer on the uh, bridge rectifier down there. So bridge rectifier is just down at the side of these capacitors here. So we're just going to spray circuit freezer all in that area, blow the temperature of the bridge rectifier down. And now it's it's come back on by itself. So I think it is something to do with that bridge rectifier, but I need to prove it though. I need to take it to bits again. Let's hold the two wires onto the reservoir capacitors around the bridge rectifier. And then what I need to do is I need to monitor that voltage till the fault condition occurs and see whether it's a bridge rectifier itself that's breaking down. But as you've just seen there, it powered itself off. I've then gone and sprayed a uh, circuit freeze on the bridge rectifier directly and it's brought the power back. So it does look to me as if there's some relationship with the bridge rectifier or those regulators in that area. But we'll need to prove it. It's just a shame that in order to see the fault again i've had to reassemble it all put it back together usual thing as you do with these faults you know sometimes they're difficult to pinpoint and i sort of convinced myself it were to do with those capacitors but i think that's only part of the issue um you know obviously so as the temperature warms up see that's on now 
and by energizing those relays on the front panel to switch these outputs on there's now drawing more current from the bridge rectifier because as we saw earlier the trace came off the regulators after the bridge rectifier went all the way down to the relays that were across the back of the board and thus um, it supplies all the relays across the entire unit there was also a plug which fed a wire off to the back board down there and there's relays on that as well as we know for switching the fan and other out and taps on the transformer so i think that uh, ancillary supply from the bridge rectifier supplies not only the microcontroller display but also supplies all the relay switching side of things as well as the converter for the high voltage for the display too i think so we'll see how long it lasts but i've just proved it there by cooling it down and it did actually come back to life so that's interesting so i think as the temperatures increased on that bridge rectifier there'll come a point if it is that obviously uh, which i think it is because we just cooled it off using the uh, the um what they call it the circuit freezer oh, yeah it's gone so i'm going to leave it now and i'm going to spray circuit freezer again on that uh, that component so i'll just find the location of the bridge rectifier again which is down there where those oh it's come back by itself look so i think as it heats up and then it goes off then perhaps it might come back as well so i'll just spray on that bridge rectifier There we are, look. So that's interesting, isn't it? That spraying on that bridge rectifier causes the power to come back. So, right, I tell you what we'll do now then. We'll strip it all back down, which I wasn't really looking forward to doing. It looks like I've no choice. And then we'll uh, we'll do some measurements while it's actually powered up but stripped apart. So that'll be interesting to try and pinpoint it a bit further. Back with you shortly. Well, I've got it all apart again after stripping it all down. We've got this board. I've removed the aluminium case from behind the LCD display thing. I did want to remove this board just to have separate to plug in and then we're, we're minimising risk of damage in the front panel of scratching it. But then of course the LCD display is in separately and it's plugged in there and that'll be flapping around. There's a chance of damage in that so I decided against that. We'll just keep the case as it is. But just be careful. I think we've got some bubble wrap round here just to protect the card and bubble wrap just to protect the circuit board from shorting out the chassis as well uh, but basically what uh, my plan of action is <clears throat> is to obviously we've got the uh, the the secondary of the mains transformer and it looks like we've got various taps coming off as well of this uh, secondary of the mains transformer which goes to this board here uh, we've obviously got a bridge rectifier which is our little friend that we were spraying with circuit freezer earlier and uh, then of course we've got all the four diodes within that as well that make up the the actual package of the bridge rectifier and then we have the positive and negative um, sides of the device uh, we've obviously got in this case um, two lots of electrolytic capacitors which are those big sweaty ones we were changing out earlier and then we've got with the look of it um, coming out here I think that was a um, a 7815 voltage regulator and I think we had a minus I think the minus on this was taken there's a separate diode on the top which you can just see down here and I think the way that's formed is they they've taken another tap off this side of the transformer there uh, fed that down here then to a diode which is obviously facing the negative formation and then basically then there is a voltage regulator in here uh, which is that's minus uh, that's plus 15 and then that is minus 15 volts so obviously there'll be a reservoir cap something in between there and there as well there'll be capacitors on the output of this which we saw earlier i think the one on one of these we were replacing as well so basically that's how it's formed. but um so i think that's the 7915 series voltage regulator which is obviously a minus voltage regulator now what i plan to do in this measurement because i suspect that this is the issue 
is I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder a wire on the input of the 7815 and on the ground and we're going to take those two off then to our meter and we're going to read those and we're also going to do the same here we're going to take two wire outputs from there and the output and we're going to read those and we'll do it on this one as well same there on the output as well across here to our meter and that way then we can meter out what's going on i suspect that the easiest way i can solder on here is on this uh, this is that um, voltage uh, output which goes straight off to the uh, what appears to be the um, relays now i've not drawn it on here so i'll do that what there is uh, just here there's a tap going off then which goes off then to the relay coils so there's multiple relay coils in the system which are getting plus supply volts. Obviously each relay coil will be taken to ground using probably an MPN transistor uh, to, to ground to obviously pull the relay in, uh, the relay contact. But there's multiples of these relays that are supplied directly off this higher voltage rail which I think is going to be about 25 volts DC, I suspect around about that. So obviously when we press the button on the front to energise these relays then the current consumption starts to be taken from the bridge rectifier in order to energise these relays because there are obviously several relays on, on there as you can see they're all soldered in here I think there's a, at least two relays there possibly three with the look of it relays across the, the front I might even be four um, so there's like four coils it's energising when all the outputs are switched on together which is what we were doing when we were pressing that button earlier on the front panel uh, which is this button here all on that one when we press that then uh, we were getting obviously all the outputs to come on in order to do that it needs to energise the relays on the board um, so that the outputs can be switched you can see the the print here going from the uh, different terminals to the relays as well but the the relays are there so there's uh, how many other four relays one there one if that's a relay i think it is yeah it looks like a relay two three four relays in total plus as well there's relays on the other board down here which is formed by that connector because when we follow that supply line it goes down it parallels to the relay coils then it goes to this connector here which is these pins and those pins are a plug then this wiring loom which then goes off to the back board where there's more relays there so this supply that's leaving this bridge rectifier across these reservoir capacitors probably supplies quite a lot of current obviously overall when all the relays are energized and thus um, if that supply fails then naturally the whole power supply will fail because the 7815 regulators supply all the logic areas and all the op-amp circuits and the voltage comparison, the current manage, the current circuits that manage the uh, readout of the, on the display and all the microcontroller supplies as well all derived from those 7815 regulators. Then we have a, a non-regulated supply that then also supplies the relays um, so that ancillary supply plus the relay supply is all derived from that one bridge rectifier which to me seems underrated it's obviously getting very hot exceptionally hot anyway so um, these are the reservoir capacitor uh, solder um, connections um, basically the reservoir capacitors were soldered just uh, straight across these terminals so what I'm going to do is I'm going to resolder our wires onto these terminals and then obviously get the measurement taken directly from there so that's what we'll do next now one of the other things as well that i forgot to mention as well is off this point here that goes off to these relays um, there's also um, as we discovered earlier in the video um, a tap off that unregulated supply which then goes to um, just down here you can just see the stitching that's going through the board there in this area and that's that uh, regulator uh, shenanigans that's going on in this area, like a book converter regulator. And I think this is a voltage regulator format there. Some kind of book converter going on here. And I think this is supplying either a high voltage for the display panel at the front for the backlight. Or alternatively, it's um, which it could be unique for that. Or it could be that it's some kind of in this area for regulator for the 
microprocessor. Um, I doubt that they would employ such a circuit as this um, for the obviously regulate the supply to the voltage regulator uh, the microprocessor. I think that'll be done by this IC here. I'll look at that more closely. But uh, I think these um, chokes are used in synergy with these ICs to switch to produce a high voltage which then goes to the display board because I think that the um, I'm not sure how the display is backlit on these whether it's LED backlight which I don't think it is because I can definitely hear a, an oscillation um, most people that are into electronics engineering will, will come across these um, these book converter oscillators that are used for generating high voltage they have a unique ringing sound it's not like a flyback transformer output on a on a CRT TV that high pitched whistle it's more of a tinny rit rattle sound uh, which you get through these coils so I think it's it's more of a dirty switching for that because all they're interested in is just developing the high voltage for the backlight to illuminate the display and I can definitely hear the frequency of this changing as this uh, bridge rectifier uh, down there is, is getting loaded with the uh, relays when these relays are switched on so it's reducing the voltage um, probably because this can't keep up with it for some reason I don't know but uh, yeah so we have this uh, extra line that comes off there from the unregulated that appears to then go to another voltage regulator which could be a plus 5 volt for the uh, MCPU um, and then obviously prior to that then I think we'll probably have some magic book coils and um, and switching arrangement going on there I think with the look of it there's definitely some naughtiness going on there I think and then probably got some more coils here and then reservoir caps etc for the high voltage for the display something of that order but uh, I'm not sure yet what this one is um, so that's what I suspect is this device down here um, that looks to be some kind of a regulator fixed regulator I could be wrong but you never know so there's something we are going on around here as well but uh, again it gets its supply from the same um, components as the others so that just about roughly covers it I think this is obviously I uh, just want to correct something here that that would be um, um, a zero volt there I know I, I say a negative this would be the plus and that would be the minus so that zero volt connection normally will go to chassis and then obviously you know all the references to zero volts so that's that's that side of it that's what we refer to as ground but it's not ground as such it's just the chassis rail taken to the zero volt connection of center tap on the um, bridge rectifier basically or the the um, reference to that anyway so right we'll uh, get some wire solder and take it from there right what we've done we've soldered wires onto the uh, pcb down there we've got uh, the ac input to the bridge rectifier measured on the rag oscilloscope on a channel channel one and then on the fluke scope meter we've got the dc output from the bridge rectifier across those reservoir caps so we're ready to make a measurement now and uh, turn it on so that's what we'll do and uh, we'll see what happens and uh, it's not producing an output at the moment got the AC waveform there on the um, oscilloscope at 5 volts peak to peak and then across the bridge rectifiers we've got 2.8 volts now off camera what I did earlier before getting to this stage of making the video I powered it up it all came up fine uh, when you switched all the outputs onto the relays click for that the bridge rectifier started to heat up and the voltage started to come down and then also when you selected it in parallel mode so more relays came on to click into parallel connections for the front then it really started to drop did the the voltage on the capacitors and it, it started to decline and if I sprayed circuit freezer on the uh, bridge rectifier which I'm hoping to show you in a moment then the voltage came back up again to around about 7 volts and then it started to go down again and once it gets to about 5.5 .5 volts thereabouts then it clicks off because obviously the microprocessor can't run and um, then it shuts down so naturally um, when I then sprayed it with the uh, circuit freezer then the, the supply came back so currently across the reservoir capacitors we've only got 2.8 volts DC now well 
I'll do is uh, using the circuit freezer is if you keep your eyes on the uh, voltage on there while I just spray the bridge rectifier down here then you'll see what I mean so let me just get back on that bridge rectifier yeah, you can start to see the voltages starting to come up now sometimes it just comes right back up it kicks back into life and it just starts working and other times it uh, stays around about three volts thereabouts it's intermittent what it's doing but um, you'll see in a moment it'll just shoot back into life again it's really weird it's like some kind of temperature related fault very bizarre fault it is uh, but all the time the um, the AC waveform coming in remains constant so it's obviously not an AC supply issue it's the output but it's a very strange fault I'll just spray it again just make sure we can get onto it and then see what happens but uh, I've had it do this a few times where you spray the circuit freezer on it and then suddenly it comes back to life now what I'll do is I'll turn off the supply to see whether that restores it because it might be that it starts going into conduction once the supply is being reduced beyond 0.6 of a volt and it starts to conduct and goes into conduction so let's see if we can get it down bleed it down to that sort of level really and that way then uh, you know we can see whether we can get it to uh, to come up but it's a very strange folks um, uh, obviously I've had it where the voltage starts to go down, which I'll show as part of this video. It starts to go down to around about five and a half, six volts. And then when you spray a circuit freezer on it, it starts to come back up again. And it's really quite strange to see. Um, but yeah, let's just have a look now and see what, what we can do. Here we are, look. Let's see what it's got to. 2.9 volts. It's not come back. It's not come back to life as yet. So... Now, if I touch the the uh, bridge rectifier with my finger, just to uh, give it a bit of body warmth and see what happens, it's a very strange thing because we've got five volts going in. You know, that's that's the voltage that's going into it. It's uh, obviously being held at 2.9 volts now there is a fuse obviously that glass cartridge fuse there that's actually a uh, protection fuse so if the current was excessive then the fuse would blow naturally because um, the current would be too high so it seems like a diode junction problem in that bridge rectifier some kind of um, a thermal fault where the junctions of the diode seem to be conducting only partially when the, the bridge rectifies at a certain temperature which is really strange so really quite bizarre I'm just trying to get it to show itself at the moment see if I can get to get the uh, temperature to change you never know might be able to do that technical manager was just going to join us then but uh, he's gone away so 5 volts remains constant and yet that changes. See if I can give it some more circuit freezer. Let's see if I can get get it to spring into life. Let's have a look. Let's see with See we're nearly there. It's 3.2-ish roughly. I'll just give it some underneath. But uh it's a very strange thing. What I'll do is I'll leave it switched off well, let it get back to room temperature and then come back and see whether we can get it to play ball. Once it's powered up and the voltage comes back up to where it was prior to me making this part of the video, then we'll see it then decline and uh, while watching the, the scope. But um, yeah, a bit of a weird thing. Oh, here we are, look. Now it's back. Powered up by itself. There we are, look. Now it's six point something volts the supplies come back obviously we're still five volts there but then we've got this five point you can see there it's been been loaded a bit now if i spray some circuit freezer on it you'll see that then the voltage starts to climb once the thermal effects there 
and uh, we can more or less control it but uh, it should be around about 7 volts DC that's where it normally starts at once it's settled back to room temperature once it gets to 5.5 volts DC then you'll see in a moment it'll uh, it'll click off doesn't like it once it gets to about 5.5 volts which when it's getting 5 volts peak to peak AC waveform plus uh, RMS on top with the reservoir capacitors then you know we should be getting about uh, 7 8 volts DC but uh, we ain't getting that so once it gets down to about 5.5 that's when it'll click off again and then because uh, the bridge rectifier is getting very hot at the moment now it exacerbates it when we switch this into parallel mode with all the outputs on and then you'll suddenly see it'll it'll really affect it and then suddenly it'll go off which is uh, very shortly at 5.4 volts any second now it'll go off and you'll see it try and recover itself as well the um, output voltage from the bridge rectifier will come back once it gets down to about five and a half volts but it'll go off any second now I think once it gets down to about five and a half and then it'll uh, it'll go off very shortly it's dropping quick 5.3 then up to 5.8 5.7 you can see the waveform changing quite uh, quite a lot so it's uh, it's struggling um, let's just put some here we are look it's having quite a, a marked effect on it but it's uh, it's a very strange fault it really is very strange but you can have different configurations obviously there you are look it's killed it back up to 7 volts again and then it comes on clicks on and starts reducing its supply and of course the waveform for the rectified output starts to uh, worsen as it drops down because that's when the bridge rectifier is getting its coldest so if we just freeze it again and it delays it you see it gets the voltage to increase it reduces the time scale in which it takes for it to turn off but uh, something very strange and then all of a sudden it'll drop down to about 2 volts it'll power off drop down to 2 volts and stay there and sometimes when you spray circuit freezer on then it'll it'll increase then back up to 6 7 volts and it'll repeat the cycle all over again but that that waveform onto the uh, our friend here the oscilloscope um, I think it's powered off it's a pain in the ass is this thing right so that always remains the same that five volts going into the bridge rectifier but yeah let's see it's gone off it's clicked off again the voltage has gone to two point uh, eight volts now and it'll remain off until such time as it's restored now if I touch the bridge rectifier with my finger it's uh, quite cool at the moment it's not warm so it's very strange it's uh, I'm suspect it is the bridge rectifier itself that's failed and uh, and thus needs replacing so that might be the next thing that we'll do we'll get some bridge rectifiers out the spares bin put another one in see how that goes because I think this is a thermal related fault we've still got the five volts coming into the bridge rectifier but as you can see we've got nothing coming out really 2.9 volts if there was excessive current being drawn from the bridge rectifier it would be very very hot straight away I wouldn't be able to put my fingers on it there we are look it's booting back up and we're back up to suddenly 6.41 volts um, while the bridge rectifier gets hot again so if it was a current consumption issue I believe that naturally the bridge rectifier would be constantly hot which it isn't that uh, the fuse may have blown the cartridge fuse because of the excessive current taken which it hasn't done so I'm fairly certain I've narrowed it down to the bridge rectifier being defective and now we can see the sharp decline of voltage on the output but yet the 5 volt AC input still there at 50 Hertz and yet the output ripple is markedly uh, seen there at the top um, 
Now, interestingly enough, if I do uh, volts and then AC, how many volts AC is the ripple? So, looking at 300 millivolts, 390 millivolts AC ripple at 100 hertz there on that uh, measurement of the DC output. And yet the DC output is at 5.9 volts. So it'll go through all this cycle, you see, it's turned off again. Uh, now we're back up at 6 volts, it'll boot back up. And that cycle will get longer and longer, depending on the recovery temperature of the uh, bridge rectifier. So, yeah, very strange uh, fault. Very strange fault indeed. But the uh, the bridge rectifier itself, at the moment, if I put my finger on it, it is, uh, oh yeah, it's burning my finger end. It's really hot. Now if I just put some circuit freezer on it, just to see whether it behaves better with some circuit freezer on there. It, uh, it behaves differently depending on what uh, what's going on. There we are, look. Going back up to 6 volts, and then as the temperature goes up again of the rectifier, because it's quite hot, then starts to decline quite quickly. And now it's gone off again. See, it drops suddenly, you see, down to like 2.9 volts. It's, it just suddenly loses its um, rectified output. It just drops. So, to 3 volts, which I find quite strange. And yet the bridge rectifier, to touch it, is cold. It's not even warm. So... If that was a current consumption issue, i.e. the output of the bridge rate was shorted, that would be getting stinking hot. To pop the fuse as well, there would be definitely noticeable signs that there were excessive current consumption taking place. So, Let's get to the stage now, replace the bridge rectifier and then uh, take it from there. Okay, so I've left it switched off a while now, just to sort of acclimatise back to room temperature again. Uh, we'll just reconnect the... Uh, IEC lead at the back and uh, and that so right so we've got it coming back up and the voltage at the moment is reading uh, 6.85 volts now to warm the um, we flick it into parallel I think it is and then all outputs on then we can see that it will start to decline and we can see it's getting loaded there because it's having to Obviously, regulate the supply, but uh, that it's giving, but it'll start to uh, to go shortly. So that's what's happening anyway. But the the output um, on the scope stain there. So yeah, it's a strange one. Very strange. Five point nine seven. I just wondered if I could circuit freeze it again. <laughs> Back up to nearly 6 volts, 5.9, 5.4. Yeah, so it has a little effect, not too much of an effect. But if I touch that bridge rectifier, it's uh, it's already getting warm. It's getting too hot to touch now, it's burning my finger end. So Now, one of the things is as well, once it clicks off and it goes down to say 2.9 volts or thereabouts, DC when I switch the supply off so that um, I'm letting everything discharge down the discharge rate of the reservoir capacitor from 2.9 volts takes several minutes to discharge below 0.6 of a volt um, DC so if it was a short circuit or, or some faulty component unless it's voltage related of course but say it was a resistive load because of something like a tantalum capacity going short or some other problem, there we are, it's gone. Once it gets down to that, and then it'll come back again. Um, so it's like thermal shutdown really, but the thing is, is that if there was a resistive short on the output of the bridge rack, which went through earlier discussing about the fuse might blow, the bridge rack would get really hot when it's at two point something volts, then what would happen is, when you switch the supply off and you're measuring the voltage across the electrolytic capacitors, if it was that kind of a resistive short, then the charge would immediately go. As soon as you withdrew the supply, the, the voltage would drop to zero. But that isn't happening. Those capacitors are staying charged and it takes several minutes to reduce from two point something volts right the way down to 
when the fault happens down to the 0.6 of a volt. So it does look like to me as if it isn't a load issue as far as externally from the bridge rectifier. I think it's just the bridge rectifier itself has got weakened over time and the thermal runaway is occurring and thus it's um, getting to the stage where it's breaking down as it's getting hotter. So yeah, very, very odd one, very odd one. So, but uh, there is a point though with this and I'm just trying to get it to do it now where it will not just click off and then click back on and go through that cycle but suddenly it'll drop down to about three volts as if, as if it gives up once it reaches a certain temperature of heat um, and then the voltage drops it'll it'll just give up um, so it's interesting that but I have noticed as well the waveform on the display uh, obviously changes slightly in amplitude which is the uh, unrectified basically the reservoir caps are not keeping up with the load um, so that mainly happens when I introduce a more complex load on it which is there when all the relays are energized then it seems to decline more quickly but it reaches a stage where the bridge rectifier has got that hot that it just goes into a thermal shutdown and stays around about 2.9 volts DC, roughly around about that mark. Uh, I think the reason why it goes off at 5.5 volts as well is as we drew on the diagram earlier, where there's a separate voltage regulator, probably a 5 volt regulator for the microprocessor, and that'll be dependent on getting more than about 5.5 volts input. If a 5.5 volts uh, or less input is achieved on the input of the regulator, then the output can't be regulated, so it'll probably shut down. So anywhere between 5.5 volts to, say, I don't know, plus 20 volts is its operating range on the input to the um, microprocessor voltage regulator. But um, anything below 5.5 volts, if it's got a 5 volt output or, say, a 3 volt output, I don't know what the processor runs at on this, but roughly 5 or 3.3 whatever volts, um, then the regulator can't regulate and it'll shut down. So it's probably a 5 volt regulator. And uh, obviously when it gets 5.5 volt input then it'll be too low for it to do any reference for the regulation of the output and then it'll fail the uh, the output and then obviously the microprocessor will, will go off. So we're going to get to the stage shortly I think that now we'll definitely be going into thermal runaway because the regulator will be drawing maximum current. The um book converter for the display backlights drawing current we've got all the relays energized in different configurations as well um, and just the pulse of changing from one set of relays to another sometimes is enough to trigger it off uh, but we're staying at 6.4 volts at the moment but it's varying all the time you know 6.6 .6 nearly 6.5 6.4 it's jumping about a bit so that's quite interesting so we'll see how long it lasts before then the thermal runaway takes place but uh, I mean if I touch that bridge rectifier now um, that's on the back oh yeah it's it's really quite warm very warm it's must be a good 900 degrees maybe or hotter than that so we'll see how long it lasts before it fails again so we're down to 6.4 already and that's just for me touching it so maybe my warmth has added to it now we're down to 6.3 6 volts now and then 6.3 so it's slightly erratic um so i don't think it'll be long before it fails it seems to get to a certain temperature there you are look 6.4 now it'll boot back up again probably so I think it's uh, definitely getting, getting down here. So, yeah, interesting. Now, whenever the output relays are not switched on, this fault takes a lot longer to occur than it does when the output relays are switched in. And then once the output relays are switched in, then... Uh, now we're getting the 6.5 volts. See how long it lasts for at that, but yeah, doesn't last long. 6.4, it's dropped to already. 
now 6.3 it's declining quite quickly the AC waveforms remaining constant on the input so it's not as if the transformer's uh, got an issue down to 6 volts nearly now not be long it'll power off ah now if you look at the waveform there there's all that noise coming out look you can just see the waveform change then there's something going on with it I don't know what but there's something definitely going on with it there we are it's clicked off and now it's rebooting again but I don't know if you noticed that we had there we are 2.7 volts there we are look it's gone so that's it now it's back again it's trying to boot up um, doing its boot up thing and then it's down to 6 volts then it dropped to 2 point something volts and stayed there so we've definitely got some kind of uh, thermal runaway issues I think now it's gone 6.7 volts it's coming back you can see there's some uh, it's all over the place yeah, it's up and down, up and down, jumping up and down. Very interesting. Let's have a look. There you are, look. Now we've got the 3 volts now. 2.7. Back up. It's jumping up and down. It's all over. So to me, I mean, it, it looks to me like as if with a time, if I alter the time signature... Two point seven volts. It's staying at that then. That's it now. So it's like the bridge rectifier's got that hot. It can't produce an output now at all. It'll stay at two point seven volts, and then all of a sudden it'll come back to life once it's cooled down, and then it'll stay at six point seven volts. It's back up, and then it'll start to uh, to fail again. 6.3 so as it gets hotter it'll be heating up now so it's all over the place as you can see it's very strange very odd so yeah how bizarre but at least you've seen it by your own eyes okay so while it's like that and it's held at 2.7 volts and refusing to power on if I uh, just Spray some circuit freezer then. There we are. And it's coming back up. So then we're back to 7 volts. Whatever it's cold. So we should take it out that thermal runaway that it's in. Then, then we're back to square one. Until it obviously heats up again and then starts to decline. Which it's doing now. If you spray a bit more circuit freezer on it. Maybe then it'll keep it up at the near 7 volt mark. But of course circuit freezer thaws out really quick, especially when at these temperatures. So at least that proves by using the old circuit freezer on the bridge rack, it uh, restores its supply again and uh, and then gets it to come back. However, earlier when I sprayed circuit freezer on it, when it was 2.7 volts, it wasn't coming back. It took a few sprays over a period of time and I think it's this intermittency thing um, where, you know, it has to be at the right internal thermal temperature as well as the external. OK, we desoldered the old bridge rectifier out the uh, circuit board, which is this. Now, obviously I've uh, got a selection of bridge rectifiers out my components drawer. Obviously that's too big. Um, these are too big, obviously. But what I did find, uh, which will be a bit difficult to install, I quite like this one because it's got the hole in the middle where you can put a TO220 heatsink on the top for a transistor so obviously if it gets hot you can heat sink it away that's rated probably around about five amps is that but it's going to be very difficult to install because obviously the thickness of the leads is just a little bit too big for the holes in the pcb plus as well the space limitations on the other side to fit that in but it's it's a nice little uh bridge rectifier is that one 
<laughs> quite a nice size where these are too big but yeah these have got thinner leads on them these have got thinner leads so technically could mount that sort of in the back of there and uh, you know just have it sat in there be a bit proud a bit big you know a bit reluctant to do that so what i might do is go back to um a replacement bridge rectifier of the correct size and shape that was originally the power supply was designed for but what i'll probably do is have it standing off the board probably that that much the reason for that is because the heat will transfer down the legs of the um bridge rectifier and it will allow it to heat sink it more as well whereas if the leads are short then obviously the heat will dissipate onto the print on the board and that's one of the reasons why we get a lot of heating in the board in that area um, plus as well it might keep the device a bit cooler the other thing I could do is um, get a bridge rectifier such as such as this uh, bolt it down to the chassis of the uh, the frame in the in the bottom there and then run wires up to the board but you know that's probably for another time we'll see whether this uh, resolves it by putting this in so I'll, I'll reinstall this but we'll leave a bit of lead length on it so that uh, it allows the device to get more airflow around it and uh, as well as that heat sink away wick away the heat into the legs of the device so that's what we'll do we'll see how it goes okay we fitted the bridge rectifier in down there and we've had it on for about half an hour and all is good so far uh, the voltage coming out is holding steady at uh, 7.67 volts it doesn't vary and uh, what I've noticed as well on Dave Jones's EV blog uh, video that he did a few years ago this power supply held a thermal imaging camera from the rear so thanks to Dave doing that video I know that the bridge rectifier normally gets very hot around about 90 degrees according to what he said in his video now um, Obviously, this bridge rectifier is still hot to the touch because I've been touching it before making this part of the video, and it's uh, it's you know it gets quite warm, especially when the relays are engaged for the output. Um, so, at its current state, it's running quite hot. So, I've got the thermometer with the uh, thermocouple. What I've done, I put a bit of heat sink compound on the rear of the um, bridge rectifier, some Dalcoring heatsink compound and I'm just going to put that onto the uh, onto the device there just to get a temperature reading so we're looking at 75 degrees at the moment now uh, once I enable the relay obviously for the output let's have a look and see what happens so let me just put the camera down and press that little button there Right, so I've, I've pressed the output on now, and uh, it's staying around about, it's just starting to climb, look, now that the relays are engaged for the output. Um, it's starting to just go up a few degrees, and it'll start steadily climbing. Now, it's pretty... Uh, Yeah, look, 77 degrees. So I think that'll keep climbing well up to about 90 degrees. So when all the relays are energised for the output, for the three outputs all on, obviously it's drawing more current from that bridge rectifier because it's energising the relays. Now the voltage is staying okay, unlike before. It's getting up to nearly 80 degrees now, not far off. And I think that's going to start climbing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that uh, I'm going to leave that going. I'll just leave that gunk on the end of the wire. Oh no! I'll just leave that gunk there on the end of that wire. It's one thing about Dalcor in silicon heat sink compound, it gets everywhere. No matter what happens, it gets everywhere. Anyway, um, I'll leave it switched on now. Depending on what output you select, depending on whether you. You go parallel or series, parallel configuration, then all the outputs on. 
depends how much current it's drawing and I'll leave it going I think for a, another half hour with the outputs when the outputs are switched off so the output relays are de-energized for the three channels then it draws less current so thus the bridge rectifier stays around about 76 degrees but the moment you switch all the outputs on and you have all the uh, you know the the, the wherewithal um, then unfortunately that's when it uh, starts to consume more current and thus heat the bridge rectifier up so as you can see there I've left the uh, bridge rectifier with the um, longer longer leads on it so that it uh, helps heat sink the heat away from the device as best as possible but um, I think it's a bit of a design flaw on these um, as to why that's happening whether it's a common fault on them or what I don't know but I do know on the EV blog forum there was a guy on there who had the same problem with the bridge rectifier on his model so whether it's a bad batch of bridge rectifiers but from to run at that temperature all the time prolonged use they're bound to fail so if it fails again uh, in time to come hopefully it'll carry on working but if it if it does you know six months time a year's time or whatever fail again because i'll keep this on the bench and um then we know it's a bridge rectifier it's a design fault perhaps i should have chosen a higher rated bridge rectifier and maybe chassis mounted it or something like that to keep it cool but yeah very strange uh, strange effect so it's been on a while now so let's just have a look at the temperature again and uh, take my wire with the silicon heat sink compound on the back of it and touch it on the uh, on the back of, of the bridge rectifier there look let's have a look so we're at 81 degrees call it 82 nearly so it's keeping around about 81 degrees 82 degrees so yeah that might be what it'll be at all the time now constant interesting very interesting indeed so again these wires that go all over the place that's another concern when you got something on so we'll see how it goes anyway i mean the voltage is holding steady anyway at seven point six eight volts i think it is yeah and we've not got very much ripple we haven't got that noticeable um sawtooth wave that we had previously um showing obviously a sign that the bridge rectifier had failed and uh and then obviously the the temperature reading is uh about 82 degrees at the moment so i'll just leave it on with all the outputs on so giving the bridge rectifier the maximum possible load with um driving the ancillary supplies then obviously for the microcontroller the display all the relay configurations etc as well so that's in parallel that's in series mode and some more relay switched in there so i've had it switched on half an hour with the parallel mode and all the outputs on and now we'll switch it in ser in series mode with all the outputs on different relay configuration and test it to its maximum and then we'll see what happens then but uh, i'm just um i don't know I just find it a bit strange that's all that um, there's this sort of design flaw in it but uh, I can't see it being a relay coil that's going low resistance because normally when relay coils um, tend to go shorter winds on the coil then they draw far more current anyway and thus um, they will begin to burn or smell and none of the relays are hot to the touch when I touch them or even warm so that's not a sign that a relay coil is taking more current perhaps than it should be um, so there's all that to consider too so I think it's just um, a, a design over I think the, the person who has designed it has assumed that the temperature would be cool within the unit with a fan or um, maybe not taking into account the, the small compactness of the bridge rectifier and its uh, operating temperatures 
So yeah, it's obviously, you know, will cause it to fail over time probably. Uh, for years running at that on the bench, that would cook itself to death and then obviously fail over time. So be interested to see how many other units like this have failed with that fault. So right, we'll uh, just leave it to test now for about another couple of hours. I'll just leave it alone. I'll be in here just in case it bursts into flames and then uh, we can always put the fire out with the fire extinguisher if it does that but I think um, we'll measure the temperature again in about another half hour um, on that bridge rectifier to see what its absolute maximum becomes back soon right so we've left it on now uh, a good half hour uh, and we'll just measure the temperature again now with this particular configuration to see what uh, what what we're getting. Let's have a look here, and uh, let's have a look. Hmm. Just seeing if there's a little hot spot on it by moving it around. Yeah, everything's on. It's about 76 degrees, thereabouts. I'll put the thermal couple on the top of a device where the heat would obviously wick to the top. On the top part, but as we can see there, it's not, uh, it's not too bad. 76 degrees, so it's roughly about 77, 77 degrees roughly. Give or take a, a few degrees, so yeah, about 76 degrees. I mean, I, I've noticed as well that uh, ugh, I've noticed as well that the uh, when you hold your hand here, I mean, the voltage regulators themselves are just warm to the touch. That resettable fuse has got a fair. That feels quite warm, the resettable fuse, it's warm, which I wouldn't be expecting, but anyway, um, yeah, there's, you can definitely feel warmth coming off this area, uh, these electrolytics are, are just very lukewarm, but the bridge rectifier obviously is quite warm, so that's, that's warm, those two are not too bad, yeah, so I think we've just the way it's designed that's all, you know, and it runs that way. Interesting. Anyway, it's all back together again now. Managed to uh, reassemble it all. Um yeah, so that's the finished product. Uh we've got the bridge rectifier uh mounted off the uh off the board, slightly raised. Unfortunately there's this so the can eat sink compound which is still all over the place gets everywhere does that dow corning silicon eat sink stuff but anyway so that's the finished article now uh, we're ready to uh, power it up again and do some final checks etc while it's uh, in this state before we put the lid on but um, yeah very interesting uh, little problem don't often come across that. You used to get that in TVs many years ago. And that's when you used to be able to fix TVs to component level and make a living out of it. See if you could do that today, I doubt it. Everything's all on one board now, surface mount, no uh, no revenue in that. So, yeah. It's been a while since I've had a bridge rectifier fail like that. Normally they go fizz bang and release the magic smoke and go into a black charred mess, but... Uh, this one didn't, and we'll uh, we'll live and learn with that one. I think this uh, repair's definitely been one where it's uh, had a few tricks up its sleeve. As this power supply, um, we've gone from one extreme to the other. We thought that the reservoir capacitors that were originally in that were uh, in the device prior were uh, faulty, which they were, but it's due to it being cooked by the overheating bridge rectifier for years on end being warmed up next to them and then we thought that was the only issue and then uh, it evolved into then a further 
fault which we weren't sure whether it was something beyond that power supply that was somewhere else on the system that was loading it um so we had to check that out and then the regulators as well the um, 7815 series positive and negative voltage regulators which we also checked which are these two here um, wasn't that the fuse didn't blow that supplies the bridge rectifier um, but yeah it was getting quite warm around there and then we we traced it down to the bridge rectifier itself which has got a thermal runaway issue um, very bizarre problem anyway all seems working now everything seems fine again obviously we've raised it off a of PCB to allow the heat transfer down the legs so it heat sinks better but um very strange indeed very strange anyway i quite like this power supply it's a nice little funky power supply and it'll go nice on the bench with the rigol scott so we'll keep it and um quite quite like the supply so yeah very strange very strange anyway i hope you've enjoyed the video but uh, we'll just whip the lid on and give it one final test and then from there We'll see what we can do and we're, we're going to be joined now by the technical manager who's been giving us advice all along as to uh, as to what's been going on with it and uh, here he comes for a final quality inspection test he'll just give it a quick once over and um, let us know whether he's uh, dealt with it so having a sniff at the soldering iron so but yes he's um will no doubt give his approval very shortly as to uh as to whether it's repaired or not so we'll we'll see what happens back soon okay so that seems all okay now everything's back to normal as it should be voltage outputs i've just checked them all and current tested it Everything seems to be okay, so I'm happy with the repair. Um, the voltmeter is reading correctly as well with the output, so everything's uh, back to how it should be. So, yeah, hope well, you've enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching. Certainly an interesting repair, this one. A um, little bit tricky, a few tricks up its sleeve, as we saw earlier, but nice little video, so... Hope you enjoyed it. If you like the video, please subscribe. There'll be more videos to come. And by all means, leave comments in the description below. And um, thank you for watching and catch you again. Bye-bye.